We all have a story to tell. Let's tell yours. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast with your host, Jason. Come together and listen to journey stories and more from interesting people. Welcome your host, Jason. Three-time top fuel champion. Second winningest driver with 62 wins. 12 races. One in 12 finals in 2010. Future Hall of Famer in this year of 2021. This is Larry Dixon. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on your show. Thanks so much for coming. So, Larry, it's well documented that you got into drag racing because of your dad, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, ever since I was a little kid going to the races with uh, with my parents, and uh, uh, I just wanted to grow up and be like my dad and race cars. Couldn't get enough of it, right, as a little boy? <laughs> No, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I mean, you, you go out to the races and, and, uh, I think when I grew up, maybe it's a little bit different now, but, uh, I mean, cars were such a part of Americana, uh, when, when I was growing up and, and, you know, going to those events like that, it, it seemed, you know, there were so many people that had either a street car that was hopped up or, you know, beyond all of that and, and racing it, you know, whether it's IndyCar or NASCAR or, or drag racing, which is what I grew up around. Right. So did you start in junior dragsters then? Well, um, I wish. Uh, <laughs> I'm old enough that they didn't have junior dragsters when I was a kid. Uh, that, did they that came along. No, they didn't. Uh, that came along a little bit later than that. Really, really neat uh, program. Uh, you know, to be able to get the, uh, you know, young kids, you know, uh, into the sport instead of just like I did, you know, you just run around and get in the way. <laughs> and were you in vehicles now? What was your first car then that you actually raced? My, fir um, my first car that, that I actually owned and raced, uh, it'd be my street car, which was a, a 1955 Chevy. Uh, oh, cool. you know, I got it. Uh, yeah, I think I got it like in uh, sixth or seventh grade, didn't have a motor, didn't have a trans. And it was like basically working your summers, uh, you know, wh wherever my dad was working at the time, uh, mostly machine shops. But, uh, you know, earning money and trying to, uh, you know, put the car together. So I just kind of pieced it together about the same time that I turned 16 and got it running. And our high school had a, a bracket uh, racing type program. So that we would go out to our local track, which I grew up in Southern California. And, and the only track at the time that was still left uh, that ran our weekly series was Palmdale. So um, we went up to Palmdale and ran our cars, uh, you know, in our high school team against other high school teams. And kind of where my, you know, my own, my own personal driving race cars started. Did you think at that time, I want to do this for a living? Yeah, uh, no question. And, and, and really the street stuff was just, I, I don't know, maybe to occupy my time until okay. I could get, you know, into the big cars uh, like, like this. So it was, uh, you know, that's what my dad raced was the top fuel cars. So um, it, it really just seemed like uh, uh, I'm just kind of waiting to get older to where I could, you know, start working towards that. And did your dad know at that point, like, my son's going to do this. Was he supportive of it? And he pretty much knew that that was your path. He knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, you know, he's, you know, had a lot of, uh, friends, you know, that tried and failed. And, and my, I don't know that he was 100% supportive towards it, but it was like, if that's what you want to do, you got to figure it out and do it on your own. So that that's kind of where it was at. And it's, it's definitely not easy. Um, it wasn't like, you know, just hand you the keys to a race car and go race. I mean, it, it, there's a lot to it. And there's a lot of different ways to work your way into the driver's seat. And uh, so I just uh, started working on uh, various pit crews on, on different racing teams on the tour and did some racing on lower level cars and, and just kind of worked my way up to uh, the pro series. Would you say then, Larry, that you learned the mechanics of the car even better than driving of the car first? Oh, 100%. Because I, I, I was on a pit crew for maybe, oh, I'm going to say close to 10 years. 
before I got a chance to go pro. So yeah, I mean, there's, you know, the, the short block of the engine and the clutches and, and then the cylinder heads and, and all the different parts of it. And you, you get a new car in the winter time and I'm the guy that's putting that car together and, and doing all the assembly work. So yeah, I mean, from one end of the cut, uh, to the other, I feel, uh, you know, very comfortable, uh, around it. Um, so, you know, the one area that I didn't have handled was, was the driving part. So when I, you know, get, get that opportunity, but I, I could tell you from working on the car as much as I did, it made me feel really comfortable when I got my opportunity, you know, just, just the little things that go on with the car, which are probably nuances, but I mean, it was like, there was nothing that could go on with that car that rattled me. I mean, and I've been through some, quite a few incidents, uh, you know, and, and, uh, different points in my career, but uh, nothing's nothing's ever rattled me. And I feel really confident and comfortable in that car. And that car, you know, that car's going to take care of me. It feels like another part of you, right? One hundred percent. I mean, it's it's such a it's a calming feeling. Like when you get suited up in that car and you got those belts on and everything's uh, tightened up. That it's just, I don't know. I, I you know I get like goosebumps home. talking about it a little bit, but it's a. Uh, um, I, I enjoy, uh, running down the track in one of these cars. I can tell. And it's ama- It always is amazing to me after so many years of doing it, that each time is still exciting, right? Oh, for, for sure. I mean, every event that you go to, it's going to be another town. It's going to be, uh, if, if you're, you know, whoever you're racing, you're going to match up against somebody different, you know, you're pit crew or your crew chief might be different from, you know, you know, one season to the next and, and it's going to be something different about it. So it's, uh, uh, I've never been bored going to the racetrack ever. (laughs) So what year did you actually first get into a top fuel car? Top fuel car. I I got licensed in 1994 and I was still pit crewing for the team that I drove for, which was, uh, Don Perdome, Don, the snake Perdome, you know, huge NHRA guy. And uh, worked for him for a number of years, and and uh, situation kind of came into play that where I could get licensed in the car and 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 help with testing, uh, you know, on off weekends or off days, and so uh, got in the car and did that. And so that was in 1994, and then ended up turning pro in 1995. What's the licensing process in NHRA? When I talked about, I'd done some lower level driving and it was, uh, uh, alcohol dragsters. So if you're licensed for an alcohol dragster, which is really one step below top fuel on those style of cars, um, you basically can get licensed in three runs and they call it an upgrade. And, and so you'd make, uh, you know, a a quarter track run, you know, a half track run, and then, you know, a, a full run. And, and so with that, um, you know, you make your three runs and, and you're doing it in front of other licensed top fuel drivers and the track signs off on your license and along with a couple other drivers to, you know, make sure you know what you're doing and such. And, and so that, that's the, uh, that's the process. Thank you. So you turned pro in 95. What was your first year like? I, I say peaks and valleys. Before my first race, we did some preseason testing. Um, and we went up to Bakersfield, uh, California to, to be able to do that. And the first run that we go down the racetrack, uh, run underneath the, the national record, you know, our crew chiefs work on some new parts over the winter time, along with getting me in the car. We make our first run and we're under national record. It's like, wow, this is awesome. It's going to be a great start to the season. Next run, um, he's got a different supercharger he's going to put on it. And he's really thinking the car's going to go even quicker and faster. So you get about halfway down the racetrack, uh, have a rear tire blow, and it takes the rear wing off the car and uh, immediately spins the car all the way around. Um, I'm upside down. I crash into both walls. I'm on fire. Just like that. I mean, one run to the next. National record, the next one, you're upside down and on fire. So um, that was the start of my year. And then we go to the, the first race, which is a Pomona, the, the Winter Nationals, you know, get a backup car, uh, get it all put together, um, go to the semifinals, go to the next race. Next race is in Phoenix. We win that race. Uh, you know, the car I was getting in, the team I was with, it was, you know, it was a great package. You know, Don Perdome finished second in the points the season before. So it was a real good car. And, 
you know, it gave me the confidence. If I don't do anything dumb, we can have a great year. And, and I tried not to do anything dumb, and we had a great year. Um, got rookie of the year, uh, won Indianapolis, uh, which is, you know, our Huge. big, big event uh, uh, of the season. So uh, ended up finishing third in point. So it, it went it went good. But, I mean, there's, you know, peaks and valleys to it. You know, it, it started out, you know, like it, it, it could have obviously gone either way. And um, sure. just – and, uh, you know, being growing up around the sport, you know, those things are going to happen at some point in time. I was just hoping I'd have a lot more runs under my belt before I ended up, you know, upside down and on fire. But um, that was the case. And then I, you know, ran for another, gosh, five, six years maybe before I got upside down. So it balanced out. It just, uh, right. it was uh, a <laughs> hard way to start out. Was the snake really supportive after that first year? Was he pretty excited and pumped up? Oh, for sure. I think, you know, when I licensed in the car and the, and the license, you know, like just ran real good in the car and, um, and, and just, uh, felt very comfortable in it. And I think that got him excited about continuing on as a team owner, you know, with and hiring a driver, basically. I mean, the right. teams, teams weren't run like that back then where you had hired drivers. They're, they were very rare, uh, to, to have that most of the time. Whoever owned the car is driving the car and, and you get a sponsor or not and, and go. And I think, you know, running the car like like we did, it, it kind of, um, I don't know, kind of lined everything up to where, hey, I could do this. And, you know, you went from a one car team to a, you know, two and then a three car team and did that for, gosh, probably 15 years, uh, you know, before shutting down. And Larry, you you had major sponsorship at this point, correct? For sure. Uh, you know, our rookie season, we had uh, signed up with Miller Brewing Company. A snake got wind that they were looking to get back in the sport. And so went there and uh, sold the whole thing. They believed him that, you know, I could, you know, race and, and run good and be a, a good spokesman for the company. And we were with Miller Brewing for a dozen years. So uh, it was a great, great uh, opportunity. And uh, just uh, it was, yeah, couldn't, couldn't be... You wouldn't be talking to me if it wasn't for them, uh, right. really, because uh, they they allowed us the opportunity to have our card funded to where we could go out there and, and uh, run hard, run good, and, and and do well. So we won a couple championships with them and and quite a few races. Were you involved in the contractual talks with Miller Brewing Company? Not not necessarily. I mean, not down to the nitty gritty and stuff like that. I mean, everybody. Uh, everybody's got a role on the racing team, you know, mine's, you know, hired to, to race, um, right. you know, maybe a little bit more involved on, uh, you know, there'd be like a, say a personal service contract where you're doing appearances for, for, for the company outside of the events, you mm -hmm. know, you're going to different retailers and bars and retail accounts and, uh, make appearances for them and trying to, uh, uh, promote the brand. So let's talk about that if you don't mind. So how many appearances did you do outside of the racetrack per year? Oh, gosh. Uh, there there was one year, uh, and I don't remember which year, but literally there was 120 appearances uh, that I did out, outside of the racetrack. And everybody's like, Boy, that's a lot. And it's like, yeah, not, I mean, it. maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's, uh, you know, everywhere you go, um, people are talking about racing, wanted, you know, wanted to talk from that standpoint and, you know, they'll feed you a beer or something while you're there doing your appearances. So it's, I, it, it wasn't like digging ditches or anything like that. Uh, re really again, enjoyed that time and, and got to do a lot of great things with the company. So you enjoyed all of that extra work basically and never shut it down. Oh gosh, no. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, uh, um, they're a great company. I mean, and on the other side of that, they, you know, you got to do a lot of great things with them. I mean, they, you know, I got to go to World Series games and NBA finals and Super Bowls and, and, and you're doing appearances, you know, ahead of those events and stuff. So it's, again, it's not, uh, not hard work. And, and, you know, they're allowing that, you know, they're giving us the, the funding to go run a race car. They want you to go to a few places. No problem. Back in that day, what did it cost to run a top fuel team? Oh gosh, uh, you know I'm going to say the first year that that contract was probably uh, 1.8 ish million, somewhere in that range. You know, it was probably 
by the end of that 12 seasons, it was probably close to double that. Um, but, you know, through that course of time, it went from 18 events on the tour, you know, up to 24. So you're increasing your schedule by 25%. So cost is at a minimum going up 25%. And, and, and they also brought on uh, hospitality, which, which they didn't have. So where you could uh, basically, like at an NFL uh, game, or an NBA game where they'd have the the, the luxury suites, you know, right. we, you know, Miller Brewing would set up, and they're the first ones to do it, really, to set up their suite, you know, at hospitality right next to the car where we pit the car in the pit area, and they could conduct their business, you know, having the retailers come out and, and VIPs and and be able to conduct business like you would at an NFL game or an NBA game. What does it cost to run a team today? Do you know? It's it's changing really fast, and they're doing things to try and bring the cost down uh, to really? do that. Um, there, there's more. Uh, well, for one, there's 22 events I believe on the on the schedule right now. Um, there's quite a few two day events, so you have a lot less qualifying runs going down the racetrack. So the, they're they're doing things to try and uh, bring the the cost uh, of racing down. But it's still going to be to be to compete at a, a in a top five situation sure. um it's going to be a minimum of two and a half million at an absolute minimum and that's still fairly low compared to other forms of motorsports wouldn't you say uh, if, if you're comparing it to nascar and indycar absolutely um yeah. it, it would be a, a bargain but i mean you have everything that you do uh, when you go to a company, I mean, it's it's almost like they have a calculator in front of them. And it's like, well, what is your annual attendance? What are your ratings like? And then they start punching these numbers in and then they give you a value on your sport. You know, no different than NBA or and, you know, NFL and such. So um, you, you have to uh, um, you have to put it all in perspective. You know, NASCAR's got Daytona 500, and they've, you know, they're on network TV every week. Um, IndyCar's got the Indy 500. Um, so the, the, those are bigger events that we have to compete with, and they command a bigger number than than uh, what they do in uh, drag racing. What I've always enjoyed about the NHRA, though, is the fans can get up close. And that is something that lacks in other forms of every sport, not only motorsports, right? Which to me is fantastic to be a fan and go up and you can see the cars within literally within inches of your own eyes. And obviously the drivers are there too, and they're available for autographs, which again is not common in other forms of motorsports or even stick and ball sports, right? For sure. And you bring up a great point. And, and, uh, on on my side of things, growing up in drag racing, I just thought that's how everything was. You know, every sport was like that. And then you actually get out into the world and you see, you know, NFL. Like you're not going, you're not getting in anybody's locker room. You're not on the sidelines. You're not getting down next to the players. You know, NASCAR, you need a you know hot pass and and it's different things. IndyCar, you can't. There's a lot of things. Formula One. Oh, my gosh. You, you think it's hard to get through the airports. You know, it's even harder to get into a Formula One pit area. So right. it's just uh, but but growing up in our sport, I'm like, why aren't all these other ones like this? And it's not. That's one thing that I, I, I'm glad you brought it up because it, it, it does give fans great access. Um, you know, there's good there's good and bad to the access, too, because um, if you're so accessible, there's not a lot of value to it if you can get right up there. I mean, you can go right, you know, the biggest name in our sport is John Force, and you literally can go to an event and get his autograph. You know, you can't say the same thing about uh, Michael Jordan or or any of the, you know, NBA, right. NFL, Major League Baseball. You can't go to a game and expect to get an autograph from somebody. You can go to an NHRA drag race and absolutely expect to get it. So it's... Uh, um, and sometimes when when things are easier to get, then they're not thought of as as such a bigger deal. If and that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it's interesting because I look at it as a perspective as there's a lot of value there. If I'm a sponsor, I see that as a lot of value because now the fan is interacting with the driver, the crew, everybody. 
And that's how you build rapport with people. And so people have a connection with Larry Dixon as a person rather than a figure on TV as a drag racer, right? And we're all human and we always want to think that everybody's different. The reality is we're not. You, you just happen to be a top fuel drag racer and that's really, really cool. And there's a very small percentage of people that can say they've ever done it and will ever do it, but you're still a human being. And it's nice for people to see that other side of Larry as a, as a person, right? It for sure. And, and, uh, and I think that you might struggle with that a little bit in, um, in drag racing because you know, that the amount of opportunities and exposure that you actually get on television, you, you, you show the run and you might get an interview. And if you get an interview, you got to make sure you thank your sponsors because they're paying the bills and they want their names mentioned. Yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, some people think that, Oh gosh, why do you have to say all the names we know? And it's like, because you have sponsors saying, you know, like you, they, they want the names out there and, and, and want the mentions. So it doesn't give a lot of opportunity to get your personality out there. And it's like, well, you know, but John force seems to be able to do it well, but John force has been doing it since the seventies. So that means he's been on television for almost 50 years. You know, I should know everything about John force if I'd been on TV for 50 years. So it, it's, uh, it, it's hard for up and coming and even, you know, like guys that have been or girls for that matter, that have been racing a shorter amount of time. You just don't get that opportunity to get the uh, personality out of there. But then you bring in social media that we have, you know, for the better part of 10 years or so. And, and, and you do get to see more of that, you know, right. the Antron Browns and such, you know, that you're getting their personalities and you're getting to yep. see, and you know, guys like, uh, you know, Stevie, yeah, Stevie Jackson, you know, with the pro mod stuff, you know, if, if, if you're into race drag racing, you probably know who Stevie Fass is. And it isn't because he's on the, the regular show. It's because of everything that he's doing, uh, you know, on YouTube and social media. Right. So let's get into now you're successful at it. And what happens that ultimately ends your professional career? Well, I, I guess in my case, it's probably no different than uh, anybody else's. And, and it's uh, uh, sponsorship. Fun. Uh, funding gets, uh, uh, you know, companies, you know, uh, in a case like Miller Brewing Company, Miller got sold and then a whole nother European group, you know, well, it started out with a South African group and then a European group bottom. So they, they get acquired a few times and, you know, their ideas of marketing and advertising might be different. And, and you see that with other companies that are still even American owned, you know, like one might be all in on drag racing and the next year, a new president comes in and he likes golf and he's going to put in all the money towards golf. And you know what? The company's golfing if he wants to golf. So um, that's it. So uh, that's why you really have to uh, work, uh, work really hard to, uh, and, and keep your sponsors happy and, and, and ride as long as you can. But in, in my case, you know, not being on the tour, I mean, it's 100% has to do with funding. Do you miss it? I miss the competition. I miss um, sitting in that car. Like, I mean, I just, uh, you know, really, I, I love that. I like seeing, you know, a group of eight or 10 people all on the starting line racing another group of eight or 10 people on the other side there. And, you know, let the best ones win. I, I, I miss one against the other. I, I miss a little bit of that. Things I don't miss yeah. are a lot of the, the politics, you know, there's, there, you know, you get around anything and you, you know, you know, not to steal a line, but you know, like the, the don't worry about the old guy behind the curtain, moving all the levers, you know, like, I mean, you, you, when there, there's a lot of politics involved sometimes with rules and, and such and, um, you know, like me, I'm such a proponent for safety um, that sometimes I I struggle uh, a, a little bit on on that side of things. So I don't miss some of that, but um, but I still I still like to go to the races. Maybe not as much. I got this car behind me here. You know, it's a two seat top fuel car um, that we run not all the time, but but uh, a few times a year and and giving ride experiences. So that 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 occupies it. And and I have a, a traditional top fuel car as well too. Um, it'll let me uh, 
get behind the wheel and, uh, you know, in, in, in front of large crowds and stuff and go out and, and play and, and enjoy the racing, but also be with the fans. Can you run that traditional top fuel car anywhere at any time still? Yes, absolutely. And- I'm still I'm still licensed uh, in NHRA and IHRA. And so, yeah, we can we can absolutely, you know, if we had the funding for it, we, you know, we could be at Gainesville for the opening uh event and so it's uh but again it's so expensive the rule package that's in place uh again talking about the you know if you're going to be on the tour you know you got to be in the two two and a half million dollar range and right. um you know and that's that's money that's hard to find anyways and then you throw a pandemic in the mix and it, it makes it a little more challenging do you feel as though if you had the funding you could go out there and run up front 100 percent one hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, not not a problem, and, and it's and it's not because you know of me, but it's like the group of people that you gather, your team. Um, yep. You know, you're only as great as your you know weakest link, and and I still feel I could put together a, a great team and be able to go out there and challenge uh, right out of the gate. What's the biggest expense in top fuel racing? Is it the engines? Uh Great question. I mean, I guess if you, you divide it up two and a half million dollars, where's your money going to go? Um, yeah. A third of it's going to go to uh, payroll. Uh, a, a third of it's going to go to uh, parts and, and, and equipment of what you would go through during the seat. And, and then the other third would go to uh, travel. Uh, sure. and not just, uh, you know, just you know, the hotel bills, you know, getting your rigs up and down the road and, and, and uh, all of that. It, it's uh it ends up dividing up and I mean, you can squeeze one a little bit here, or, you know, or, or one way or the other, but um, you're not going to squeeze 50% out of your budget to, to go out there and do it. So um, and you bring, it's, you bring up an interesting point in regards to travel. One of the interesting things that I've always found in drag racing is that the crew for the most part drive everywhere. They don't fly like other forms of motorsports. Is that indeed true? Well, yeah, it's it's very true, and it and it goes back to budgets and, and the amount of money. Uh, you know, if you had an IndyCar car budget or uh, a NASCAR budget, you might be flying around a little bit more. But the the, the money is not. That's why you know most of the drag racing teams are uh, based you know somewhere around the Indianapolis area, because you can get to most of the events outside of the West Coast stuff in, in a day's drive. So. Um, you know, it makes for a lot of things, you know, you basically can get in a car and drive to it. And, and two, you're not missing work days, you know, traveling, you know, getting your stuff, you know, if it takes two days and that means two days back. So now all of a sudden you're going to miss almost a week uh, at the shop. So, you know, when you can get it down to like one day travel, it, it makes, uh, makes it definitely more productive. Does NHRA limit your testing? No, not at all. They still don't limit it. No, your budgets usually limit your testing. That's interesting, though, that they don't do that to really cap it off for the guys that don't have that $3 million budget, right? Because that is a great way to save money, right? Yeah, yeah. I I don't know that a lot of teams are doing a lot of testing. It isn't like like you might see in other forms where that you know somebody might just have some an absorbent uh, you know budget and then they just run the wheels off of it and then that team is so far ahead that we need to bring them back to the rest of the group um there isn't anybody taking advantage of it uh from that standpoint i mean the you know the number one team for the past few years has been the steve torrance team the capco team and uh they uh um they might test twice during the season at the most and and really? and you know two two tests isn't going to get them that much further ahead of everybody else it's it's the package that they got the crew that they got and, and the and the crew chief you know ultimately well i hope steve torrent sees this and puts a car together for you <laughs> well he was running his for a while then they got one out for his dad and now the, the, the two of them are running real strong so um you know i get I guess if maybe if uh, the, the oil business gets up in the fifty sixty dollar range, maybe they can bring another car out as well. <laughs> so, I, and so, I don't know if I'm gonna be praying for that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So you mentioned the two seater car behind you. So, tell us what it is actually. What you've done with that car? It's 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 exactly what 
what it is. It's a traditional top fuel car that's been modified and, you know, added another cockpit. See if I can uh, kind of uh, maybe make it so you yep. can see it a little bit better Got it. there. Yep. And uh, um, we put somebody in the back seat and uh, go down the racetrack. Now, we don't go a full quarter mile run with it. In insurance won't let us do that. Uh, uh, well, <clears throat> which is fine. But so we run to the eighth mile. But with that, I mean, we can run the eighth mile, get up to almost 260 miles an hour in about three seconds. So it's still uh, still quite a ride. I haven't had anybody disappointed at the ride. I can tell you that. I have no doubt. So <laughs> what, what have you stretched the wheelbase? Four feet then, roughly? Yeah, just the, the length of a foot box, basically. Okay. And, okay. And, yeah. And we had uh, Murph McKinney designed the car and built the car. And he's the ones that he built, you know, quite a few of my championship cars in the past. And, um, you know, I... I literally trust him with my life and, uh, and I feel, you know, I'm going along for the ride too. So it isn't like I'm going to put somebody in something that I wouldn't get in. <laughs> right. Right. So Larry, if you would, if it's a little bit longer wheelbase, I'm sure torsional rigidity of the chassis is slightly different than a traditional car. What does it feel like to you as a driver? How close <sighs> to the original does it really feel? It, great question. I mean, my my distance from the from my foot box to the front end of the car is exactly the same as as a traditional oh. top fuel car. So so everything that I see forward is about the same. The car is a, a little bit heavier because you've got an extra foot box. You've got an extra passenger going along for the ride. So it's a little bit slower. Um, but but it, I mean, as far as going down the racetrack and everything, it's uh, it feels like the real thing. It really, it really does. Hurts. And, and Oh yeah. And I mean, we take the drivetrain out of our traditional car and put it in that car. So it's a, you know, I'm not, I'm not slowing this car down a whole bunch to, uh, um, you know, like it's, you know, a Disneyland ride or something like that. It, this is, I'm so proud of our class and, and our sport that it's like, if I'm selling a ride in a top fuel car, you damn straight that it's going to be a real top fuel car you're going for a ride in. So, it, I mean, it, it, you know, we just, we set it up so it doesn't like, you know, smoke the tires right off the starting line, but it's still, it'll, it'll go zero to a hundred in less than a second. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, I don't know of anything else on the planet that accelerates like that. Right. So, um, uh, so we're, we're trying to give people everything, uh, that, that, you know, all the Anton Browns and Steve Torns is, uh, would feel. So how do you deal with the, uh, for people that are listening that might not know, Engines in a top fuel car after every run get torn down and completely rebuilt, right? So how do you deal with that on this car? Are you dialing down the clutch so you don't smoke the tires, say, and then the motor is kind of detuned, but it, yet it's still strong enough for that eighth mile? Yeah, it, the, the, this engine gets serviced just like it's the real thing. I mean, it really? can, you know, go through the cylinder heads. It gets eight new pistons in it every run. It gets a fresh clutch in it. I mean, the clutch that we run in the car is a six six disc Allen Johnson clutch. It literally came from, you know, uh, well, I mean, we put this car together a couple, three years ago. So it literally one of the clutches came out of Brittany Force's trailer when Allen Johnson was a crew chief there. And we put it in our car, and, you know, we're off to the off to the races, so to speak. So um, it's it, it gets everything just like the big just dogs. Like yeah. That's yeah. And, and for me, again, for me, it's, it's, you're going through the engine, you know, from an insurance standpoint, you want to make sure everything is perfect, but at the same time, it's, you know, we still got it wicked up pretty good. And, and, uh, I would rather take the time later, just like the other teams do, um, and, and go through those parts later, you know, but we get fresh, you know, it gets fresh equipment every time the car goes down the racetrack. So, that's got to be a massive expense to to run this car just down. The, and do you plan on when you do a it's a rental ride, basically, is what it is, right? Yeah, well, yeah. It's people are paying for a ride. If either people or companies or racetracks are paying for rides. Yeah. So do you set up? I mean, can you run multiple people per day because you got to tear down the motor? And obviously, you're not at a race where you're trying to turn it around in an hour and a half, right? 
Yeah, well, it, you end up turning around in about an hour and a half, two hours. You know, the the the, the pros are doing it in about 35 minutes now. So, like, um, but we'll absolutely, yeah. I mean, the the last time that we the the last event of the season for us was uh in, at Memphis in September, and we made four runs in a day with it. That's so, incredible. Um, yeah, it's um, again, it's the, the the people, you know. I mean, I have uh, I don't have a full time crew because it, this isn't a full time business, but right. but the guys that I have going with me are are all people that that were on the tour, you know, at one point in time, and necessarily might not be anymore for one reason or another. But sure. I, but they, but everybody on the, the the car has won races or championships that are they're pitting it. And, and again, it's like, I'm trusting them with my life, you know, not right. just somebody else's. So um, it, it, it's a sense of comfort. And those guys are just as animated and excited about this car. Cause this thing is, you know, that it's got the nickname that the unicorn, so to speak, <laughs> Cause, because it, it, it's, it's rarely seen, you know, people all believe in it, but you rarely get to see it. So to be a part of it and, and, and sharing that and gosh, again, you know, the people, when they go for a ride down the racetrack, uh, it, that is, I mean, we tagged it said that would be the ride of your life. And it kind of is, I mean, can you imagine going to a Christmas party and like the small talk and the, you know, you end up in the crowd where the guy's been in a top fuel car. <laughs> you know, like yeah. he, he's going to own the night, and and it's literally going to be the run. I mean, I I went skydiving one time, um, you know, twenty five thirty. Oh gosh, twenty five years ago now, probably. Um, I still talk about it. I mean, it, it, it it's such a uh, you know, new, unique thing to do, and, and and this car's got the same appeal uh, for for people in motorsports as well. And that has to give you some some excitement too to see people's excitement after a ride right there's there's no doubt about it it, it, it i get the same excitement and satisfaction out of it as i do winning indianapolis or any other national event wow. i mean because there, there's that rush and you get to but you get to share that with somebody and now there isn't another person in the world that gets to do that you know right at, at least at, at, at this level yeah you know? absolutely so, uh, yeah, I I, uh, I I love it. I I, I really do, and I I, I feel really uh, great about the opportunity uh, to be able to do something like this. And what does it cost for someone to rent a run with you in that car? The punchline is uh, nine thousand nine hundred ninety-five dollars. <laughs> it, it's it's definitely not cheap. Sure. You know? I mean, well, so, so, it isn't. It isn't. <laughs> There's some people that will say, um, wow, that's a lot of money. And then people in the business will say, I don't know how you can do it so cheap. And, and that's, uh, you know, <laughs> thank you for that. Cause it's, uh, yeah, and I mean, when you, when you put in the fact that, you know, we have to, ins we've got to have a, a insurance policy on this car. When we go to these uh, uh, venues, you know, different racetracks and such. They're not going to let you get on track without insurance. Well, right. well, the insurance, the insurance works out to uh, more than half of the cost of the run. So now all of a sudden you're, you're not leaving much. You, you start doing the math on it, you know, for fuel, you know, and, and tires and uh, paying the crew that's actually working on this car and put it in the hotel rooms for them to be in when we're yeah. going to run this car. I mean, it's, uh, I should be the opening act for David Copperfield. Cause it's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I could do it, but we're doing it. And it's, uh, yeah. when you, when, when you, draw, when you draw out the business, uh, model on this, it, it really should be right around $14,000, uh, a run to, to be able to do what we're doing. But I, I, I couldn't, there's i couldn't feel comfortable selling that so it was like what can we you know like what can we thin cut out it's like so we don't have any full-time employees so right. you know i'm the guy that's working on the car and 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 doing things in between events and i'm not getting paid and it's just you just cut out things that aren't 100 percent uh vital uh to the function of this car and, and you end up with a price tag in 99.95 that's incredible that's a heck of a deal i mean if you told me you weren't putting pistons in and uh, valves and springs and everything else, I'd say, okay, I could see that. How you're doing replacing parts at the same time. And I, are you recycling those pistons? Do you bring them back to the shop, uh, use penetrant, make sure there's no cracks on the lands, and then maybe use them again later? Or are they 
scrap metal? It, it, it would go through the same type of uh, uh, service work that any pro team would be doing. And it's you have tolerances that you, you keep these parts in. And it, as long as they fit, you know, and something doesn't get knocked out around or too big or too small or whatever the case is, it goes right back into service again. So, okay. uh, you know, a, a, a crankshaft can last anywhere from four to 14 runs and it costs, you know, $5,000 for a crankshaft. I sure. just got a cylinder head bill. It was almost $5,000 for the, the cylinder head bill on, on repairs. So it, it's a, it, we're not making house payments and we're not putting no. kids through college. <laughs> no. We're just, we're, we're, we're trying to maintain it and keep this thing going. Well, and that's on top of the vehicle that costs what? 300,000, 200,000. Oh gosh. Uh, if you, if you started from scratch, you did everything and assembled a, a complete hot fuel car, you know, ready to start up. It's going to be in the three hundred thousand dollar range, right? So yeah, it's like you're almost giving it away, which brings up a point of you're doing this for the passion and to give back is what it sounds like. You're not doing it for Larry Dixon, the household. You're doing it really because you're passionate about it. You want to share it with people, and obviously, it keeps you in a car as well. I believe in it. I I think. Uh... On a larger scale, I think that you would be able to go to events, uh, vendors and such. You could run contests and you could have fan giveaways and, and do promotions uh, with this car and help market, you know, the, the sport of drag racing and, the, you know, the top fuel class. I, I th this is one way to, to do it. And, you know, some people think you might be crazy, but um, yeah probably a little bit not not everybody's going to get in a top fuel car but the ones that do or the ones that want to um we we uh we can help not everybody's going to jump out of a perfectly good airplane you know but i'm one of those guys so uh it's uh, uh just being very comfortable in your environment it's not for everybody but for the ones it is it's an opportunity for them so that that's really what we're hoping for would it make sense that to get money from companies to go race full time, are you not able to get sponsored by a company to build morale within the company? So company X, rather than give Larry Dixon Racing $3 million to go promote that company, what they do is they give Larry Dixon Racing $100,000 and he goes around the country and takes representatives from that company and gives them a ride, basically. I like your thinking. I like your thinking. I, I, I think absolutely it can be done. And I think that from a value standpoint for that company, you know, when you start talking about those dollars and what those dollars can do, uh, I mean, there, there's, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Wait. My, my crash that I had at NHRA uh, Gainesville in 2015, where the car broke in half, it is one of the most uh, watched YouTube videos in NHRA's history. Um, uh, and it's got like a little over 2 million views in it. I take this car and I post a warm up uh, uh, and, and just hitting the throttle, just doing a warm up in the pit area two months ago. And it's got almost 3 million views with it. It's like this, this car is, is, it's a unicorn. You know, people, yep. it's the only one of its kind. So there's a lot of interest there. And so from a social media standpoint and from just media impressions, this this is uh, more bang for the buck, so to speak. So from a value standpoint, I think you could do more with it. Um, I and I, be, you know, I guess I believe in it enough that uh, as I continue to run with it, I think more people will, um, uh, you know, jump on the wagon and go for a ride. Absolutely. And I hope they do. And I really, I really think that working the angle, the opposite side, if you will, because let's face it, every business in the world has employees. And if they run a contest or in sales, for instance, if they run a sales contest, the best person in their district, a ride in a top fuel car. I mean, who in the right mind would not want to do that? I mean, sign me up. Right. Before we debuted the car, we, I, I, I was kind of just doing a personal poll and, and, uh, asking people, you know, like, you know, would you ever drive a top fuel car? No way, not a chance. 
would you go on a ride for one? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean like the, the responsibility of driving a, a car that goes from zero to 330 miles an hour in four seconds, that scares a lot of people off, but the acceleration, the ride itself, people are fascinated with that. They'd love to know what it feels like. And I'm, I'm getting that. And I see that, you know, you know, more time that we have with the car and more stuff that we put out there. I get people, you know, cause I don't, you know, I don't run ads for it and I don't market this thing. It's all just posting stuff on social media. If somebody reaches out, you know, how much does this cost? Where are you going to go run the car? And then it kind of just goes from there. So it's, it's very, very like on the ground guerrilla marketing wise. So, um, it's, uh, you know, build it and they will come hopefully. And do you do that on purpose that you're very grassroots about your marketing? Um, no, I, I grassroots going back to the budget, uh, you know, what, what we have to be able to, to go out there and do it. I, I still think that from, uh, you know, I, I'm waiting for the, the, you know, the Richard Branson or, or somebody like that go, wow, that's awesome. I want to, I want to be associated with something like that. And, and I think it'll happen. Um, I, I agree. I'm still young. I can wait it out. So is NHRA supportive of it? We could do another 48 minutes on just that alone. <laughs> yeah. I'm going uh, to say initially to the concept, I took the idea to the president and he loved it. And then he started, uh, uh, he put me in touch with other people within the company and, you know, voice their concerns and the things that you needed to do with the car uh, for them to uh, possibly, you know, bring it in. And so I took down all my notes and did everything and built it to, to their recommendations. I built the car and tested the car. And then when I debuted the car, the legal department got scared to death of the car. And uh, so they have huge issues with the car. They're, they're, they're worried about liability, you know, somebody getting in their car and um, having a heart attack and then the sanctioning body is going to get sued. So um, um, they, they, they haven't, uh, uh, at this point, they haven't taken, uh, grasp it back if that's a, a word or not. So, so I, I run on, uh, non NHRA tracks, which, uh, I actually sanctioned once, uh, okay. you know, West Palm beach and uh, Memphis and, uh, um, <clears throat> Martin, Michigan and, and Orangeburg, South Carolina, you know, they, they have some beautiful, uh, beautiful facilities. And, and so, uh, we go and run there go and run those events. I'm going to super Chevy in April in Memphis and um, I already got five rides sold uh, for, for that Gee. weekend. So, yeah, so it's not, uh, um, it's, it's not everywhere all the time, but uh, it's most of the places sometimes. <laughs> so Understood. Do you think NHRA will come around in time or do you think that that's just not going to happen because of the legal side? Well, the, their lawyer that, that has all the problems with it is the same one that said, you know, there'll probably be a day where we come back begging for you to run that car. So, um, I, you know, she's, she's dangled that carrot in front of me. So like, I'm, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hold her to her word at some point in time that I can prove that this car's, uh, that, that the back seat's just as safe as the front seat. Why would it not be? And I understand the legal side. I understand the liability. I understand that side. Why would it not be advantageous for NHRA to have Larry Dixon, the three time champ, take people down their track on a race weekend and they charge 20,000 and put 10,000 in their pocket per run? Great question. You're asking the wrong guy, though. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just, I mean, is that something that you've tried to work with them? Like, um, basically, yeah, NHRA, the, NHRA sponsors Larry Dixon Racing. You take care of the entire program. Then you, they basically, it's charged and billed through NHRA. They pay you, right? Further, what they can do is now you add cars. Now you get to pick the driver that's going to drive you down that car, down that track. So it's not only Larry Dixon racing. Yeah, there, there are so many ways that, that you can go with it. And that is uh, that that's one uh, that's great. 
Um, you know, what we're doing is not an original, maybe it's an original idea from a drag racing standpoint at this level, but it's not original. I mean, you've got Mario Andretti, uh, you know, running the IndyCar to start the biggest race in the world, not just the United Absolutely. States in the world. And he's got Lady Gaga going around the track, or it's, you know, Michael and Mark. Uh, and Mario, you know, get the green flag for, for Marco. So like right. there, there's so many things you could do with it and that, you know, bringing up the IndyCar experience because they were so helpful on, on the legal standpoint on, on my side, you know, for, for, you know, like waivers and releases and insurance and such. And so we, you know, we're basically doing the same thing. You know, they helped us a lot with that. So we're, we're doing the same thing as that. They've been in business for 20 years. So I, I didn't need to reinvent anything on that side. The, those guys are real smart on how they, they went about things and we're doing the same thing as them. So I, I feel real good when the opportunity does present itself, whether it's to a sanctioning body or to a major corporation that we have our bases covered and we are, you know, we are ready to go. Yep. And does the two seater Indy car, is that owned by Andretti Autosports? Is that how that's run? Or do you know who it, actually owns that program? It's an independent company uh, uh, away from the, the Speedway and Andretti, you know, they just, uh, they contract Mario uh, to, to come in and, and hire him to drive the car basically. So uh, it's an independent company that goes out there and again, just it, it's a, it's a marketing company. Yep, absolutely. It's like this marketing company. So exactly. So Larry, where does Larry Dixon Racing go from here? What's what's the future? Oh, As a racer, I'm, uh, I'm sure your mind never stops. No, it doesn't. There's a lot of things. Um, well, this year, I mean, you brought it up a little bit. I'm going to get inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America, uh, based out of the uh, Daytona. Um, Daytona Speedway at the museum there. So I'm really uh, very honored, very excited about that. Um, gosh, you know, what a great thing. So um, that that ceremony will take place in September. Um, so doing that, like I said, I'm going to Super Chevy. There's going to be quite a few events that will run throughout the season. Um, looks like I'll probably be taking both cars to the World Series of Drag Racing in uh, okay. Cordova. Uh, that's the weekend before Labor Day. Uh, that's their annual event. They've been doing that for 60 some years. So uh, I, I, I don't get it too far out, you know, just try to keep things in front of me, you know, just yep. take one step at a time and eventually I'll get there. I get it. Well, Larry, thank you so much for your time. I wish you much success with this two seater and I wish I could uh, go for a ride down the strip with you as well. Well, I, I appreciate the time and, and let me uh, share share what, what I'm doing and what we're doing with the car and stuff like that. And I hope at some point in time that this car gets big enough and strong enough that I can come up to you and say, hey, we're set up. We can give you that ride now. So I would love I'll it. just uh, let, let's both keep our fingers crossed that, that we'll be able to make that happen. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, nope, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Find us on YouTube and Facebook at the Intellectual People Podcast and online at the intellectualpeoplepodcast.com. Check back for exciting new episodes.